Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching History Resummarized the Roman Republic by Overly Sarcastic Productions. So, a while back I watched their video on the Roman Empire. I really enjoyed it, I liked the perspective they brought to Roman history, and so I'm going to be watching their video on the Roman Republic. I know we're sort of doing this out of order, the Empire and then the Republic, but their video on the Roman Empire was the first one I found and I'm excited to watch more of their videos on Roman history in the future. If you have any particular favorites, then feel free to leave them in the comments below. Now, if you end up enjoying this video, and I expect it will be a long one, judging by how long the last reaction was, then I would appreciate it if you would, well, first off, make yourself comfortable, maybe get a snack, and second off, please check out the Patreon and channel memberships, through which you can get access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, mm. part one. I used to think that the old adage of Rome wasn't built in a day was painfully obvious and also distinctly uninsightful. Because mm. honestly, at face value, it kind of is. That phrase is winking at you so hard it's practically wearing an eye patch. But if instead of just Rome the city, we think about Rome the culture, Rome the institution, Rome the sea conquering empire, that phrase starts to actually say something. Rome, as I hope this video series will show, was really special. There's honest- Very true. I, I do think Rome was a very special civilization, a special culture. And even though the Roman state fell, first with the fall of the West, uh, and then with the fall of Constantinople, uh, about a thousand years later, Roman culture, institutions, law, practices, religion would survive for a long, long time. I mean, basically until the present day. Uh, I feel like it's hard to underestimate how much influence the modern world has taken from Rome and everything Roman, which is so much more than, like I said, just the Roman state. Uh, and I'm excited to get into the rise of Rome in this video. I don't know too much particularly about the early Republic, so I think I'm, I'm gonna learn a lot about that era of Roman history. Honestly, nothing like it. And I think it's important to appreciate not just what Rome became, but how much slow, careful, calculated effort mm. was put into its creation. And as you'll see in a- And that's absolutely true. In their video on the Roman Empire, we saw how much slow, calculated effort was put into the survival of the Roman Empire. Here, we're seeing how Rome itself was built. Uh, where it began and where it ended up. But in their video on the Empire, we saw that same political maneuvering over time, trying to secure the survival of Roman culture and the Roman government and the Roman state. It took a lot of change over time. And I expect we're going to see more of that in this video. In a minute, early Roman history is a notoriously slow burn. Generation hmm. after generation dedicated themselves to something they'd never see the end of. And I just think that's really cool. So, let's do some history. If we jump into our handy dandy time machines and go all the way back to the beginning of Roman history, we'll be looking at an actively on fire city, which happens to be Troy. Yep. The plot twist is that the Romans are actually descendants of the Trojans. According to Roman tradition, one specific Trojan, named Aeneas, who fled the burning city on the orders of his mother Venus to sail around the Mediterranean in search of Italy. This story comes to us most clearly in Virgil's epic poem, The Aeneid. After a run-in with Queen Dido of Carthage and a journey through scenic hell, Aeneas and crew arrived on the plain of Latium in central- By the way, it all ties back to ancient Greece. <laughs> I mean, Rome and the Greek states were very close in many ways. Rome loved Greek culture, particularly when it expanded into Greek territory, it would assimilate and adapt a lot of Greek culture, Greek religion. I mean, the Roman pantheon is basically an adaptation of the Greek pantheon of gods. And, of course, there is a shared cultural heritage there. You know, there's a lot of similarities. And, of course, if we look at the ancient Mediterranean, it really is its own world. You can talk about ancient Mediterranean culture. There was a lot of shared ideas, shared religion, and shared culture throughout the Mediterranean world. And throughout that time period, the ancient Greeks were really 
one of the most influential peoples of the region, even when Rome is at its height, you know, Greek philosophy, Greek ideas, Greek religion, etc., etc., is still super influential. Italy. To make matters more Italian, the very first thing they do when they arrive is eat pizza. Wow. We're not even two minutes <laughs> in, and we're already establishing over 3,000 years of stereotypes. I can't even be mad. That's just really efficient. Fast forward a few hundred years after Aeneas to 753 BC and the brothers Romulus and Remus, mm -hmm. who were raised by a wolf, got into a kerfuffle of sorts while building some walls around their village, and Romulus ended up murdering Remus in what became the most etymologically significant fratricide in world history. That, kids, is why it's called Rome and not Reem. Oh yeah, this is the founding of Rome. Of course, a lot of this early history is basically mythological. <laughs> there isn't much actual history in a lot of these stories. Um, now, of course, if we look at it as a whole, we can learn a lot from these stories, but they are mostly that, mythological stories that the Romans told themselves about how their empire, how their country was founded. And it's very interesting that, you know, the Romans saw themselves as descendants of the Trojans. They were basically an invading people entering Italy, and that their city itself was founded on fratricide, a murder. <laughs> we can see that violence and conquest are at the very heart of Roman history, and more importantly, Roman identity. Anyway, Romulus claimed kingship over his newly walled village, and over the next two and a half centuries, seven kings oversaw Rome's transformation from backwater town to moderately cool city. And Yes, and this is the first era, sort of the era of kings, or as they've called it here, the Kingdom of Rome. Um, I think those who aren't familiar with Roman history are often surprised by this, because Rome was famously a republic that then collapsed a lot later. But, uh, at least according to the history that the Romans told themselves, and I believe there is truth to this, they started off with a series of kings. Um, and, well, we're going to see how that system collapses, but I have more to say on that. Even that wasn't a guarantee. Most of the action in world history up to this point happened in Mesopotamia and the Eastern Mediterranean. Rome is all the way on the west coast mm -hmm. of Italy. I don't think I can overstate how completely irrelevant Rome was in the broader Mediterranean arena for the first 500 years of its history. Rome- Yeah, this is a very good point to make. Rome was pretty far away from the center of the action. <laughs> You know, the center of the action, like they said, was the eastern Mediterranean and, I guess, sort of in the Middle East. Mesopotamia, Greece, Egypt. You know, this is where a lot of the most important stuff, you know, Macedonia, Alexander the Great. Think about all these important things from this era. That's all the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and in fact, what shifts the power westwards is Rome itself. Rome grows more and more powerful and they sort of shift the balance of power in the Mediterranean more towards the center, towards Italy. Uh, and Carthage might have had something to do with that as well. Though, of course, it is worth remembering that uh, if we fast forward about a thousand years <laughs> to, let's say, the four five hundreds AD, where has power ended up? Back in the eastern Mediterranean with Constantinople, Western Rome has fallen. So it's very interesting how Rome is sort of on the periphery of this Mediterranean culture, and then at the height of Roman power, they sort of bring that center of power more towards Italy itself, and then as the West falls, the center of power within the Mediterranean moves back eastwards. It really shows you how much influence that region had as we know, ended up conquering most of the known classical world, but a majority of its early history was simply a spirited back and forth between its neighbors. The Etruscans yeah. to the north, the Samnites to the south, and later on, the Greek colonies of Magna Graecia to the way further south. Yeah, and these were the first peoples that Rome conquered, and we're going to see that. Often when we think of Rome, we think of uh, its most central land being the Italian peninsula, right? Of course, Rome at its fullest extent covered a massive amount of territory. But I think if you said to a lot of people, show me what is truly the center of the Roman Empire. What is its most important territory? People would probably color in Italy, right? But Rome had to conquer all of that. There were a bunch of different people groups. And so they had many wars, a lot of controversies, um, you know, because they had to integrate all of these people into their growing empire, their growing republic. So from the beginning... 
it is a process of conquest. I talked about how violence and conquest are sort of at the heart of Roman identity from the beginning. Well, this only enforces that. Rome only grew and expanded as a civilization because they were willing to fight and conquer their neighbors. And by spirited, I do literally mean they were stabbing each other with spears. While hmm. all of this neighborly murdery business was going on, the city of Rome was building itself up both physically and institutionally, with walls, streets, a sewer system, stone temples and buildings, a governmental system reminiscent of the Greek polis system, and a religious system reminiscent of the Greek pantheon. Mm -hmm. Man, that Greek influence really got in there early. Yep, not to pause again too soon, but he's making the exact same point that I did, pointing out all of that Greek influence on Rome, and like I said, that Greek influence will continue throughout the life of the Roman Empire. All of this was going on all nice and well until in 509 BC, the Romans thought that their king, Tarquin the Proud, aka Tarquinius Superbus, aka Tarky Tark Superbus, was <laughs> a total knob. And they were getting kind of tired of being ruled, so they kicked him out, swore never to have another king again, and officially created the Roman Republic. Yes, and this is what else I had to say about, you know, the system of Roman kings. They end this system, they get rid of their kings by chucking their last king out and swearing never to have a king again. And so you can see, look, the Roman Republic was very flawed from the beginning. Uh, particularly early on, it was very weighted towards the elites of Roman society, but the Romans were very proud of their republic. It would come to be one of the most central aspects of their identity. Uh, and you can see why there was so much controversy in the late Republic when all of these authoritarians began emerging. Of course, Julius Caesar, the most famous of all, grabbing power and taking actions that brought them closer to kings. You know, it's, uh, I guess, a little bit ironic or fascinating to look at knowing the origins of the Roman Republic and how it began from, you know, getting rid of this system of kings and monarchs, and then they basically eventually return to that, though we've got hundreds and hundreds of years before we see that. Institutionally speaking, a lot of the mechanics of the Republic were already in place, like the Senate, the patrician nobility, and the Citizen Assembly, for instance. The transition to a Republic was really more of a reorganization of authority than a political revolution or anything mm. like that. Broadly speaking, the whole idea was to take their government and publicize the power so the people could participate. And the word Republic comes from the Latin race publica, which just means public thing. Structurally, the government was controlled by two annually elected consuls. The praetors ran the justice system, and the quaestors, the silliest Roman name ever, managed <laughs> state finances. Yeah, we can see here uh, a system of two co-executives, the consuls. Every time we talk about this, I always have to point out that it is rather unique. Now, we have a lot of examples throughout history of systems with multiple executives. You can look at uh, the modern state of Bosnia, for example. But it is still rather unique to have uh, your executive power split between multiple people. And it's not like it's a council. We have more examples of executive councils or executive groups. No, it is two individuals who have, like they said, mutual veto power over the other. It's a pretty interesting system to have. Uh, it has pros, and it absolutely has cons. The Aediles were responsible for the state of the city, so they handled food, games, infrastructure, and all that jazz. The Senate, though it didn't directly legislate anything, published opinions on policy that were often very quickly put in place by their respective officers down the chain. Almost mm. all of these magistrates and senators in the early Republic were of the patrician nobility. If you happened to be one of Rome's many plebeians, you might have rightly felt a little left out of this supposed race publica. Yes, and I imagine throughout this video, uh, we will continuously see that tension between the patrician elite and the plebeian commoners. Uh, time and time again, there is conflict between these two groups, which makes sense. I mean, the patricians hold the power, and they hold the positions of power. And one of the trends of Roman history, um, honestly, throughout the entire history of the Republic, is the plebeians trying time and time again to get more power and authority from for themselves. Uh, and this is a very gradual process, so there are some important points throughout it. 
but you know this will continue for a long time the plebeians unsurprisingly wanted political and social rights, and they were determined to acquire them. So on any given season of campaigning against Rome's bothersome neighbors, the plebeians, who composed the majority of the army, simply went on strike. They'd just go sit on a hill and wait until the Senate granted them the right to marry patricians, or to have their own government positions in special assembly, or to elect their own members of that special assembly, or to serve as consul. And then by 287 BC, the plebeians and the patricians were equal in everything but name. Good for them. 287 BC. <laughs> so as we can see, this process took a long time. Like I said, pretty gradual. Hundreds of years. And like they said, equal in everything but name, but we see even until the end of the Republic, and honestly, even past the end of the Republic, the patricians would always hold most of these positions of power, and the patricians would always work to defend their elite status and defend their privilege. Which makes sense. I mean, we have lots of examples throughout history when you have an elite group and a group of common people, basically, and they become equal in the eyes of the law, but in reality, there's still a lot of inequality between them. Institutionally, the Roman Republic simultaneously had elements of a monarchy, an aristocracy, and a democracy. This yeah. mixed constitution and its flexibility in governance, according to the historian Polybius, was one of Rome's greatest strengths, and I'm inclined to agree. Rome's institutions were its backbone for over a thousand years, and that's darn impressive. Okay, enough of the politicky stuff. Back to the stabby stuff. Now, like hmm. I said, early Roman Republican history is a notoriously slow burn. The struggle mm. for plebeians' rights took over two centuries, and conquering the Italian peninsula was similarly slow going. Rome was I mean, it really is remarkably slow compared to later Roman growth. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of years where we see Rome only slowly expanding throughout Italy, slowly the plebeians get themselves rights and, and Roman society evolves. And then in the era of sort of the late Republic into the empire, we see this massive and rapid expansion of Roman territory, at least compared to, to this period of Roman history. Was intent on being careful, taking small steps and taking its time. Recall mm. how in the aftermath of both the Macedonian and Mongol conquests, when you go too far, too fast, things tend to fracture. Rome spent yeah. most of the 4th and early 3rd centuries fighting with various neighbors and working its way down to only the Bay of Naples. That's a but that's actually a good point that uh, OSP are making, which is it might have been beneficial to Rome's long-term survival that they didn't expand as quickly as, say, an Alexander the Great. You know, Alexander expanded his empire massively. He died and it all fell apart. The Romans' process of expansion was far, far, far longer. We're talking hundreds of years longer. But what that means is that when they took territory, they really cemented their control over it, and Roman institutions were able to slowly evolve over time to handle all of these new people, later these new Roman citizens, and all this new territory. And, yeah, Roman institutions would survive for a long time. I mean, particularly compared to someone like Alexander the Great. It's a pretty short way to go in so long a time. They were being really careful. Key to Rome's military strategy was the doctrine of expanding defense. Essentially, Rome would never be so brash as to go out and attack someone. Good heavens no. Rome had the good manners to only fight in self-defense, and they knew that their gods would only grant them victory if their war was a just and- Self-defense. Just. Put these in quotation marks. I think Julius Caesar is a good example of this. We see many times Julius Caesar, particularly in his conquest of the Gauls, claims that a war is in self-defense or that it's a just conflict, when in reality he is making up or over-exaggerating some perceived offense that the Gauls have laid at the feet of the Romans, which gives him justifiable cause to invade. So the Romans did feel like their wars had to be defensive and justified in some way, but, you know, as you can imagine, this is not surprising, oftentimes their wars weren't really defensive, the Romans just kind of framed them in that way. I mean, a lot of big empires do that. Pious war. But... If Rome suspected that someone was going to attack them, Rome would absolutely shoot first. Uh, defensively, of course. A right. preemptive <laughs> retaliatory strike, if you will. And that is how you go on to conquer the entire world 
defensively. Yeah, maybe. I mean, look, not to get too political, but, you know, I think the uh, American Empire was taking some notes. Okay, conquer the world defensively. Uh, a preemptive defensive strike, of course, of course. <laughs> You know, I'm just saying, the tricks that the Roman Republic used to expand have been used by a lot of empires trying to seem justified or noble throughout history, when in reality their goal is just to expand and conquer more territory. By 280, Rome had successfully yoinked all of Samnium and proceeded to set its sights at Magna Graecia in southern Italy. Magna Graecia, not being the biggest fans of the Romans and wishing to keep their land thank you very much, sent for help from Greece proper, and they brought in... And we can see... 280, this is pretty damn far into the existence of the Roman Republic. You know, we're getting to an era which people are far more familiar with, and Rome still does not have control over the southern part of the Italian peninsula. I mean, don't even talk about Sicily, right? It's pretty remarkable how slow they were to conquer this territory. The big guns. Specifically, they imported the Hellenistic king Pyrrhus of Epirus. Pyrrhus fought two battles against the Romans, and even though he won both of them, his losses were so devastating that he bailed on the campaign. Yeah, and this is where the term Pyrrhic War comes from. I'm sure some of you have heard that term, um, or Pyrrhic Battle, Pyrrhic Victory. Uh, what it means is that you've won a battle against your opponent, but your victory was so devastating that you basically lose in the end. Uh, and so that term comes from Pyrrhus trying to defeat the Romans and technically winning the battles, but winning so badly that he failed in the end. After a detour through Sicily, he fought the Romans again, lost, and went home for good. Pyrrhus' <laughs> abilities to win battles coupled with his inability to not burn through a third of his army in the process is what gives us the term Pyrrhic victory. So, yep, I didn't even have to say it, they did. Uh, but also a note on Pyrrhus, we can still see the immense Greek influence on the Italian peninsula at this point, and that Greek influence would survive the Roman conquest of this territory, but there are a lot of Greeks, um, you know, the different Greek states get involved in the fate of the southern Italian peninsula and Sicily, so, you know, this is really not Rome's domain yet. This is a shared domain which they're trying to conquer, but several other powers, in particular the Greeks, are very much involved in. So, uh, good on Pyrrhus for eternally tethering his name to the military equivalent <laughs> of pulling five consecutive all-nighters to cram for a test. Yeah, it's a win, but was it worth it? So with yeah. pretty much no one left to protect Magna Graecia, Rome proceeded to swoop in. Well, yeah, this is like you pull five all-nighters to cram for a test, and then the day of the test comes, you're so exhausted that you do worse than you would if you had just gotten some sleep. <laughs> and colonize all over the place. And unlike those who employ the torch it and start over method of conquest, the Romans had a good track record of being kind to conquered peoples. Except for this next example, from a rather- Yeah, I don't know if I would say the Romans had a good track record of being kind to conquered peoples. That might be giving too much of a moralistic spin to it. What I would say is that and this is the point they're making. Rome did not subscribe to the idea that once you've conquered a peoples or conquered a territory, you have to burn everything and start over. Send real Roman citizens to settle that territory. That's not what they did. And if they did that, they never would have been able to expand as much as they would. Rome subscribed to the idea of assimilating other peoples into their culture. So, when they conquered a territory or a people... They would basically just try to assimilate them into Roman culture, have them adopt Roman practices, Roman way of doing things, uh, Roman infrastructure, Roman dress, you know, whatever, right? Roman culture. And oftentimes, when those people assimilated, parts of their culture would be brought into sort of the wider Roman culture. And this is how Rome operated. Now, Trust me, there are lots of examples of Rome being brutal and merciless to those who it vanquished in combat. You absolutely cannot deny that. But one of the reasons Rome was able to expand so far and wide was because they decided to assimilate peoples instead of just destroy them uh, and settle areas with Romans. There is a salty chapter in Roman history, the Punic Wars against Carthage, part two. 
The first war can be roughly attributed to a miscommunication with some Sicilian pirates. While Carthage and Rome may have been destined to fight each other at some point or another, they ultimately came to blows on account of both being called into Sicily to settle a fight mm -hmm. between the- And we saw this in Oversimplified's videos on the Punic Wars, so you can check them out, my reactions to them if you want a little more information. City of Syracuse and some rowdy pirates. Rome and Carthage kind of just tripped face first into war and spent most of the 23 year long war not actually fighting each other. <laughs> yeah. The issue was Carthage had been a long standing naval power in the Mediterranean, but Rome had no navy to speak of. So Rome really needed a navy and quick. This is another of many instances of Rome adapting to situations really well. Say what you will about Rome, they were immensely clever and had a great habit of taking good ideas, methods, technologies, and techniques from other cultures and using them to great effect. This is very true. Now, the point I made about how when people uh, were brought into Roman territory, Rome assimilated them into Roman culture, in sort of a, a similar idea, Rome was completely willing to take ideas from other cultures and adapt them, assimilate those ideas into Rome, right? So it, it, it went both ways. Rome wanted uh, new people who they'd conquered to assimilate into the Roman way of life, but Rome was also willing to take ideas, practices, and traditions from other cultures if they thought they were helpful. In this case, the Romans found a few beached and sunk Carthaginian triremes and quinquiremes and proceeded to reverse engineer an entire fleet of ships. You know, just casually, as you do. <laughs> Rome's first aquatic outings weren't all that fruitful, but at battles like Cape Ignomus, which is arguably one of the biggest naval battles in history, yep. Rome pulled out wins. Ultimately, Rome won the war, claiming Sicily for itself and forcing heavy reparations on Carthage. Yeah, and like I said, we saw this in the oversimplified videos, but Rome's strength in this uh, aspect really came from its ability to steal ideas from Carthage, how to build these ships, and then put their immense resources and building acumen to work, building these fleets. And they built multiple fleets because, at the beginning, they really didn't have the experience to use them. Their fleets kept getting sunk, either by the Carthaginians or by bad weather. But, you know, through Rome determination, they kept at it. They also decided to take Corsica and Sardinia because, screw you Carthage, these are mine now. In the decades following, the Carthaginians, led by the general Hamilcar Barca, colonized the seaside coast of Spain. Lo Hamilcar, father of Hannibal, who we will see soon. Uh, and as you can see, they took uh, a lot of Spanish territory, and sort of soon-ish, uh, the province of Hispania will become one of the more important Roman provinces, I would say. Or at least a very notable province of Roman territory largely for the purposes of mining silver to pay their Roman reparations. Little did Rome know, Hamilcar, his son Hannibal, and the other Carthaginians in Spain were furious over losing Sicily, Corsica, and Sardinia, and had been casually scheming to completely destroy Rome for almost two whole decades. In 219 BC, Hannibal sacked the Roman allied Saguntum in Spain. Yeah, so Hamilcar conquered and kind of settled down in Spain, uh, and that's where Hannibal grew up. That was Hamilcar and Hannibal's base of power was Spain. And they were far more interested in defeating the Romans than I think the Carthaginian state even was. Uh, I mean, look, Carthage wanted to bring Rome down a peg. They had been beaten last time. But it was really Hannibal uh, ha and his father H Hamilcar and their family who really held a grudge against Rome. <laughs> and Rome, defensively of course, declared war. Hannibal, the madman, proceeded to rather famously Leroy Jenkins his way across the <laughs> goddamn Alps with over- Yeah, this is true. It, it was pretty remarkable. Uh, quick note, we will be starting our reaction series on Hannibal relatively soon, maybe in the next week or two. So, hey, stay tuned for that. That's going to be a good one. Uh, I'm very excited to get into Hannibal's conquests, his battles against the Romans, because he was truly brilliant, and we're going to see a little bit of that here. Over 40,000 soldiers and 37 elephants. Elephants! And while elephants aren't particularly scary to us, if you're an ancient Roman who's never seen an elephant before, that thing is a four-legged giant with two <laughs> spears and a snake coming out of its face. Oh, Bottom yeah. Bottom line, they're monsters. The Romans thought they were 
monsters. Terrifying. Granted, most of Hannibal's elephants died while crossing the Alps, perhaps unsurprisingly, but it doesn't take a lot of elephants to have a scary amount of elephant on hmm. the battlefield. I genuinely can't convey how viscerally terrifying the mere mention of Hannibal's name would have been to a Roman. Anyway, after arriving in Italy... Yeah, well, we're about to see why Hannibal absolutely terrorized the still relatively young Roman state. When I say young, I know Rome's existed for hundreds of years at this point, but I guess immature is the best word. Rome is sort of entering into its... Uh, the height of the Republic, but it's not quite there yet. It's still a little immature. Uh, it, it holds the Italian peninsula and, and some of the related islands, but it hasn't expanded further. So, yeah, Hannibal was terrifying to this still rather immature empire, uh, and he really came close at times to completely destroying Rome. It was really only due to the absolute determination of Rome and the Roman people to keep going that they even survived. <laughs> I think many other cultures, many other empires would have crumbled at this point. It's remarkable that Rome made it past Hannibal's Italian campaign. Hannibal demonstrated his tactical brilliance by immediately winning two battles in northern Italy through guerrilla and ambush tactics. Hannibal and his armies would proceed to stay in Italy, effectively behind enemy lines with next to no means of supply or reinforcement, for 16 years. The Carthaginians went up and down the peninsula, setting fire to farms left and right, hoping above all else for Rome to simply surrender. Two years yep. into the campaign, Hannibal said, all right, screw this, I'm gonna destroy the entire Roman army, and proceeded to make plans for his next battle at the Roman supply depot at Cannae in southern Italy. At the battle, the Carthaginians advanced in a U-shape with four Can I? Even though this is a more general video on the Roman Republic, we always have to go into more specific detail about Can I? Uh, I, I reacted to his story civilis' video on Can I? I'm certain we're gonna go deep into detail about Can I in our series on Hannibal. It's just one of the most impressive battles of all time. 40,000 infantry forming the front line and 10,000 cavalry on the wings. The Romans, however, had almost twice as big an army, mm -hmm. so they felt pretty good about their chances. The armies met, and as the fighting progressed, the center of the Carthaginian line fell back, and the Romans pushed forward, hoping to break the retreating line. Except, at that moment when they all rushed in, the Carthaginians' African infantry and famed Numidian cavalry advanced on the flanks and effectively enveloped the whole Roman army. From there... It was a bloodbath. The Carthaginians managed to outflank and surround the Roman army, even though they were outnumbered almost two to one. That's why it's so remarkable. Also, shout out to the Numidian cavalry. They will be a scourge to Rome for a while. They are known in this period as one of the best cavalries around the world, I think. Estimates are all over the place, but the gist is that most of the 80,000 strong Roman army was killed outright and the rest were imprisoned. The yeah. slaughter went on until nightfall and in one version of the story I've heard, the Carthaginians only started taking prisoners because their arms got tired from all the killing. Jesus. It was the single greatest defeat that Rome ever suffered in its history. And Hannibal hoped that a shattered and dismayed Rome, having lost 16 legions in the entire south of Italy, would surrender. 16 legions. I mean, that is... That's a lot at any time in Roman history, frankly. But particularly at this time, that is an immense amount of manpower. Hannibal has absolutely crippled Rome. But... Does Rome surrender? Does it stop fighting? This is the remarkable thing about it. No, it does not. At once. Rome's response was simply, see you next year. And it spent <laughs> the entire winter raising more armies to go out the following summer. For the next yep. several years, the Roman army pursued the strategy of just bother him and shadowed Hannibal around the Italian countryside. He was still being annoying, but he wasn't a direct threat to the city of Rome, so good enough for now. But jumping back, can we take a... Yeah, and there's a big question about why Hannibal never marched on Rome. I honestly don't know the answer. Maybe some of you have some insight on that. But there's a lot of, you know, historical what-ifs. What if Hannibal had marched on Rome? What if he had conquered the city or burned it to the ground? I don't know. And I don't, I don't know why he didn't. Um, but some of you might have something to say on that. 
second to appreciate the sheer quintessential Roman badassery it takes to hear that you lost at least 50,000 soldiers and then turn around and tell the guy who killed them to shove it and wait for round two because holy crap that takes some serious coleones. Yeah, though I think there is kind of two sides to this. I mean, look, I think it's as oppressive as the next person that Rome took all of that and kept going. That is quintessentially Roman. This is one of the reasons why Rome survived for so long and became such a powerful empire. I would say, just a note, maybe to play a bit of devil's advocate, <laughs> there is another side to that, which is how many lives are you needlessly wasting? Thousands, tens of thousands of lives. Uh, and at some point, is it worth it? You know, I think for a lot of us, if we had such a devastating war today, we might say, at some point, <laughs> yeah, it's not worth it anymore. If you lose this many men, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, you know, it's not worth this battle because you're losing such a massive amount of people, a massive human tragedy, a massive loss of life. So that is sort of the other side of this determination to keep going. Uh, but it's impressive regardless. Serious and massively suicidal Coleones. And speaking of, in 211, the young Publius Cornelius Scipio took up a generalship for the Spanish campaign, oh. which was widely considered to be a suicide mission. Yep, Scipio. So he's sort of the Roman counterpart of Hannibal. I mean, I and most other people think Hannibal is far more impressive in his accomplishments, but Scipio is Rome's answer to Hannibal. And he's sent out in what is thought of as a suicide mission. He is a very young guy, relatively unproven. Uh, the Roman government doesn't really think he's going to achieve his goals. They think he's probably going to die. But at this point, they've been dealing with Hannibal ravaging Italy for years, so they're willing to take a chance on just about anybody. To the surprise of basically everyone, he spent the next five years successfully decarthagifying Spain to great effect. Following yep. his campaign, he hatched a brilliant plan to take the fight back to Carthage. Hmm. The Senate, thinking this was another suicide mission, told him he could do it, but they wouldn't finance his armies. <laughs> so Scipio raised a couple legions in Italy and Sicily and hopped over to North Africa. Now, while Hannibal is absolutely a brilliant general in that he did impossibly crazy stuff like crossing the Alps, campaigning in Italy for 16 years, and wiping out an entire Roman army, Scipio's brilliance came from his quintessentially Roman ability to adopt and adapt. The Romans, mm. above all else, knew a good idea when they saw one, and they almost never made the same mistake twice. Scipio studied Cannae, and he knew what he had to do to defeat Carthage. Since the Numidian... Yep, and I mean, this is why Scipio is so brilliant, and you're about to see that brilliance in action. Cavalry was critical to the Carthaginian army. Scipio played into a Numidian civil war to get some of their cavalry for himself. In there doing you go. so, he had massively weakened Carthage on their own soil and had nearly orchestrated their surrender when, oh snap, Hannibal's back. And on that day, history nerds from all around the world and across time busted out the popcorn because <laughs> this is gonna be good. The night before the impending Battle of Zama, Hannibal and Scipio actually, supposedly, had a meeting. Yeah, supposedly. You know, this is one of those tales that sounds too good to be true. Um, I, I don't know if there's any historical truth to it or if it's just completely made up. Um, there are a lot of these tales throughout ancient and, frankly, even modern history, and we should take all of this with a grain of salt uh, or a healthy dose of skepticism, uh, remembering that this, I would say, likely did not happen. <laughs> it's detailed in Livy's History of Rome, Book 30, Chapters 30 and 31. Just read it, okay? For me. Read it. It's incredible. First, they're simply in awe of each other. Then mm. Hannibal waxes philosophical about fortune, gives Scipio life advice, and asks for peace. Scipio responded, well, I was going to make peace, but then you brought an army here. I can't just leave <laughs> now. Look, Hannibal, I respect you. I really do. And you're leaving me no choice here, man. I've just got to kick your ass, dude. I'm <laughs> sorry. There's no other way. I have to kick your ass. And on the following day, some asses were certainly kicked. At the Battle of Zama, Scipio's Numidian cavalry put the Carthaginian cavalry to flight, and fighting between the infantry lines was actually very close until the Roman cavalry returned from behind the Carthaginian line to ultimately win the day. Yeah, so honestly, I think Scipio had an advantage from the beginning, or at least had the momentum. 
Scipio used uh, Carthage's Numidian cavalry against them. He managed to play into that. He brought the fight to them. Hannibal's been on Italian or Roman territory for years and years, more than 10 years. Scipio finally brought the fight back to Carthage. Carthage recalled Hannibal, so Hannibal is already, I think, kind of out of his element. This is not what he's used to for the past 10 years plus. He's been ravaging the countryside of Italy and all these Roman armies, so Scipio holds these advantages, he holds the momentum. Even so, the battle ended up being very close, but the Romans managed to pull it out in the end. It was a hard-fought and super tense battle, but with that, the Second Punic War was won. Half a century and a lot of Cato the Elder ending all of his speeches with Carthago de Lenda est later, Rome returns yep. to raise Carthage to the ground. To rub more salts in the wound, the Yeah, honestly, you know, Third Punic War, it's more Rome coming back to completely decimate Carthage. Uh, the First Punic War was eh, more of a stalemate by the end. Well, it was honestly a stalemate, but Rome pulled out some very effective peace terms. They got one over on the Carthaginians by the end, even though throughout most of the First Punic War, I'd say it was relatively equal. Rome managed to get the advantage by the end. Second Punic War, Carthage starts off leagues ahead <laughs> with Hannibal doing all his stuff in Italy, and then Rome brings it back and decisively beats them. Third Punic War, Rome goes back to uh, literally rub salt in the wound, salt the fields, destroy Carthage, make sure they will never arise again. The Romans also literally rubbed salt in the earth to make sure yeah. the Carthaginians would never rise again. Wow. Okay. Uh, there we go. That's basically exactly what I said. <laughs> okay, so there's regular bitter, there's Taylor Swift writes a song about you bitter, and then there's Rome hates you so much they wipe you off the face of the earth forever bitter. Moral of the story is Rome does not screw around, so don't screw <laughs> with Rome. With Spain and North Africa now happily Romanized, focus shifted eastward, and Rome... Pre As you can see, Rome has at this point conquered much of the Western Mediterranean. Now, they haven't moved inwards, right? I mean, they have, uh, you know, basically Cisalpine Gaul, um, but they do not have Transalpine Gaul. And what I mean by Gaul is, is basically like modern-day France, uh, the territory on the other side of the Alps. Rome doesn't hold that yet. They've got some of the coastal areas of the Western Mediterranean, uh, prominently Hispania, uh, and so now they're shifting to the Eastern Mediterranean. Proceeded to clean up the squabbling and stagnating Hellenistic kingdoms from the aftermath of Alexander the Short Sighted's campaigns. <laughs> the Macedonians had helped Carthage in the Punic Wars, and Rome considered that sufficient grounds for bespearment. And bespearment, of course, is a word that I made up for the act of getting stabbed with a spear. Anyway, mm -hmm. in that conflict, the Seleucid Greeks helped the Macedonians, so the Romans saw that, too, as provocation. Not wanting to go too far too fast, and also because they didn't quite have a big enough army yet, Rome stopped at Greece for the better part of a century and simply took to kneecapping the armies of the Eastern Mediterranean so they didn't pose any direct threat. This marks mm. a much more aggressive Roman attitude towards conquest. It was super important that Italy be unified through kindness and generosity, because that was Italy, but all of these new places were explicitly considered provinces under Rome. Even though Rome was still a republic and didn't yet have an emperor, it absolutely possessed an empire. But Yes, and this is why I sometimes refer to the Roman Republic as the Roman Empire, because as you can see, they already have an empire. And like I said, Rome did not conquer Italy with kindness and generosity, uh, but it was certainly less brutal than it was to other territories, because... Uh, and I said, if you talk to someone today and ask them to highlight sort of the main Roman territory, they'd probably color in Italy. And the Romans thought that themselves. I mean, the Italian peninsula was special. It was different than all other Roman territory. So Rome did continue to use this practice of assimilation to bring different people groups into their empire. But they are very right that all these other territories and all these other peoples were seen as far more foreign than Italy itself. I mean, the Romans themselves really did see that as the core of the Roman Republic. Um, but, like I said, they kept up their practice of assimilation, and that's why they were able to expand so widely. 
by this point. After the conquest of Greece and the acquisition of the Kingdom of Pergamum through a will, of all things, Rome was clearly the dominant power in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Now, despite... And you can see how this has happened quite gradually over time. Now, in the past couple of decades, with uh, the Second Punic War, there has been a rapid expansion of Roman territory, but this whole process has taken a very long time. Uh, it wasn't like Rome just launched into all territory of the Mediterranean and started conquering. You know, they did it over time, they took what they could, they made sure to secure their governance over different areas, and they waited until the time was right. They didn't just launch into Greece uh, and then the Middle East uh, or Anatolia. They, they waited until they felt it was a good time. In Rome's best efforts, it was about to have some serious problems, a few of which derived from the Roman patron-client system, in which a wealthy and well-connected Roman provided for his clients, who in turn supported him politically. This worked fine on a small scale, but things got problematic when people effectively tried to buy public support in large quantities. Mm -hmm. In the late 2nd century, the Gracchi brothers attempted on mm -hmm. several occasions and we watched OSP's video on the Gracchi brothers. Um, fascinating fellas. They were basically reformers, um, a big threat to the power and prestige of the patrician elite, and so that caused a lot of conflict. <laughs> to redistribute land to their supporters, among several other reforms, and when Tiberius Gracchus tried to run for re-election as tribune, he was assassinated. A decade mm. later, Gaius Gracchus and his allies were also assassinated. Whoa, Rome buddy, hold up. You had no political violence for over 600 years, you got a really good thing going. And I think, yeah, and what they're suggesting is that this is the start of a very bad trend. And it does kind of seem like this trend started with the Gracchi brothers. Uh, they were populist reformers who threatened the status quo. And so the rest of the senators, the patrician elite, used violence to bring them down. You know, assassinations. Uh, and this is a trend that we will now see throughout the slow decline of the Roman Republic. Uh, a big increase in political violence and mob violence. Please don't screw this up. Oh, wow, yeah, they really screw this one up. Well, there you go. You can see it on screen right now. <laughs> the Roman Civil Wars. And, and oftentimes, we really focus on the later of these. I mean, Caesar's Civil War is easily the most prominent. The Catiline Conspiracy is a big one. Um, Sulla, you know, I think he's pretty well known. But as you can see, there are a lot of other conflicts that I think are often glossed over. Um, but it does give you a look at this period and show you just how violent it was. I mean, there was almost constant warfare going on from, you know, I mean, honestly, from the Gracchi brothers when a lot of this violence started until, you know, the end of the Republic. Don't they? Jeez. Yikes. Where do we start? Okay, so... First, there are three mass slave revolts in Sicily and Italy. Then yep. there's the social war where most of Italy revolted against Rome, after which all Italians were granted full citizenship. And let's also not forget the... Ca and, and this is why we talk about the social war. Italy was seen as the core of the Roman Republic. But, you know, don't think that it was entirely equal either. The Romans still saw themselves above the other people groups of the Italian peninsula. <laughs> They just liked them more than they did uh, other people throughout their growing empire. But the social war did, you know, make a big step in equalizing relations across Italy. Catiline conspiracy to overthrow the consulship of Cicero. All of those civil wars were reconciled, but still, that's a lot of civil warring to happen in just the span of a half century. Yes, they were all reconciled, unlike, you know, we're getting to Caesar's civil war. That was never really reconciled. I mean, um, when we have Caesar's civil war in the reign of Caesar, the Republic has already entered basically terminal decline. Up until that point, up until the Catiline Conspiracy, all of these civil wars uh, and violent occurrences were resolved, but you got to imagine that does some lasting damage to your government, uh, your culture, your people. You know, that's going to have some lasting consequences. 
but by far the worst of the lot were the factional civil wars between the populist populares and the aristocratic optimates, mm. otherwise known as the two civil wars between Marius and Sulla. Gaius Marius, a seven-time consul and general who conquered parts of North Africa and settled the social war, headed the populares, while the optimates were led by Lucius Sulla, another successful general. The optimates were the ones who assassinated the Gracchi brothers, and when mm. Sulla came back from a campaign in Anatolia, he marched his army into Rome, established himself as dictator, and proceeded to massacre his rival populares. Damn. Twice. <laughs> he did all of that twice. That's huge! In 50 years, we went from not a single Roman being killed over politics to armies marching on Rome and carrying out prescribed hit lists of political enemies. Yup. And so... We haven't done too much content on Sulla on this channel, and I would love if there were some reactions we could do on Sulla. I haven't seen any, but you can suggest them. But a lot of the stuff that Sulla does is what is repeated later by, you know, all of our uh, our friends, Caesar, Octavian, Mark Antony. You know, they repeat a lot of the things that Sulla does, or they at least have them in mind. See, Caesar actually kind of wanted to avoid being seen <laughs> as the next Sulla, because, you know, Sulla was so tyrannical, um, and people feared that happening again. So Sulla was definitely remembered, and his influence was felt strongly down the line, particularly when we're talking about Caesar and Octavian and Mark Antony. Uh, at some points, they purposefully tried to distance themselves from Sulla. At other points, particularly Octavian, Mark Antony, and Lepidus, they honestly followed in Sulla's footsteps. Things were really, really bad in the first century. For now, though, let's recap. Rome started as one tiny, irrelevant city and grew itself very gradually through calculated means. First mm -hmm. conquering Italy, then the islands, then Spain, and soon after Greece, North Africa, and Anatolia. What astounds me is that a typical Roman would only ever see a small part of this unfold. The Romans were patient, and they knew that doing things properly and working towards something bigger than themselves would lead to accomplishments far greater and longer lasting than the floundering conquests of a Greek kid on a horse. <laughs> Damn, OSP, they, they really don't like Alexander, huh? <laughs> I haven't done too much on Alexander. I don't know too much about him. Uh, I mean, he was a great conqueror. Obviously, there's criticism to be levied in the fact that his empire fell apart after he was gone but it uh, seems like they have a particular perspective on him. Part three. Ah, the Roman uh, Republic. Perhaps Caesar. the ancient world's most brilliant form of government. It's had a rough go in its later years, but with the right people in charge, I bet that it could continue on for centuries <laughs> to come. Like this guy right here, Julius Caesar, who I'm sure will do everything in his power to preserve the Republic. Oh, he's a rising young reformer. He has a lot of good ideas. I mean, with him in charge, I see a bright future for Rome. Oh. Oh, what does he do? Ah, uh, okay. Yes, yeah, Caesar, we've covered Caesar a lot on this channel. If you want to talk about the period of Roman history that we've covered the most, uh, it would be the end of the Roman Republic, the late Roman Republic, with all of our favorite characters, Cato, Caesar, Cicero, Octavian, Mark Antony, you know, all the familiar faces. This is what we've covered the most, and... Uh, I think largely it's because this is probably the most popular era of Roman history. There's a lot of content on this era. People are very interested in it. Uh, I mean, I'm no exception. I'm very interested in the collapse of the Republic um, and the rise of the emperors. But, you know, we're at the beginning of that. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> We saw in the last couple videos that as Roman politics got increasingly factional and Roman territory got increasingly massive, things started getting increasingly civil war -y. As in, yep. they'd barely be able to go a decade between 135 and 30 BC without collapsing into some variety of a civil war. It's honestly a minor miracle that Rome didn't permanently tear itself in half before we even got to Caesar. So, True. as we push forward through history and get to talking about our old buddy Julius, I want to consider the question of whether the Roman Republic, not Rome as a whole, but specifically the Republican system of government, was doomed to fail, or whether it had any chance of survival. Because I'm curious to see what they say about this. My perspective, that's tough. I don't know if it was doomed to fail, but if, you know, you wanted to know the chances of it surviving, it was like 100 to 1, right? Uh, I mean, there were so many times when the Republic could have fallen, I think there were very low chances that it could have survived, 
potentially, maybe, but I mean, you can just look at all these civil wars and political violence throughout the years, and you can just see that decline of the Republic, increasing political chaos, so I don't know if it could have survived, maybe, potentially, I think there's always a chance if it had been steered in the right direction, but that's absolutely not the way things were trending. That's what I think of it. I'm curious to see what they say. Um, maybe they can provide some things that'll make me think about um, my view on this. Because our answer to that question really matters when we look at people like Caesar and Augustus and ask ourselves what they did and whether or not they went too far. But since I'm impatient, I'm going to give you my answer right now. To me, the Republic had almost no chance of surviving on its own. Zero. Yeah. So I think we're basically on the same page. Zero. You saw what happened in the first century. You know what kind of mess Rome was in. I love the Roman Republic. It's one of my favorite systems of government ever, but that poor thing was so screwed. So with <laughs> our- The Roman Republic was fascinating. I mean, it had a very long lifespan. It was an interesting form of government. Um, I mean, of course, it, if you compare it to other forms of government, it wasn't like it was super democratic, right? But- it was democratic in many ways. It was a republic. It had some semblance of popular control, popular sovereignty. Uh, Rome had a very interesting view of citizenship. You know, it had a lot of things that are very fascinating that would influence the rest of the world for years to come. And that we'd only really see pop up, you know, uh, a long time down the line. By a long time, I'm really talking about sort of modern history, the last couple hundred years. So I agree, I, I think the Roman Republic is pretty uniquely interesting. Sickly looking Republic on its last legs, let's meet the guy who took it out back and killed it dead. Julius Caesar. Now let's do some history. To establish what kind of guy Caesar really is... So, I, basically the way they're framing it is, the Republic was in terminal decline already, and Caesar was the one who pulled the plug. I basically think that's true. Um... I mean, look, if instead of Caesar, you had had a line of strong leaders who were intent on preserving the Republic, maybe it could have survived, but that would be almost impossible, I think. So I basically agree with their perspective. Caesar took it out back. And then, I mean, I guess truly Augustus was the one who killed it, but the Republic was basically already dead, <laughs> to be honest. I'll spin you a yarn about some Cilician pirates. When Caesar was in his early 20s, he managed to get himself captured by a band of pirates mm -hmm. who wanted to ransom him off for 20 talents of silver. Yeah, this is a, a kind of an amusing story. Silver. There's no agreed upon conversion between talents and US dollars, but for our purposes, let's just say that one talent is about one million dollars. So when Caesar heard this sum, he straight up laughed at them and demanded that <laughs> they ask for a much more respectable 50 talents instead. The pirates, charmed by Caesar's overwhelming diva-ness and razor-sharp <laughs> cheekbones, I might add, were all too happy to keep him around for the sheer entertainment factor. He played yep. games with them, told stories, and even wrote poems and speeches for them. Sometimes they'd joke about his speeches being bad, and Caesar would respond by saying that when he got free, he'd come back and crucify every last one of them. Funny joke, Caesar. I bet he wouldn't actually do that. But this story, and once again, I don't know how true this is. This is one that I've heard many times. It's very amusing. But it does give us an insight into Caesar's character, his charisma, his ability to command the respect of others. You know, these are things that would be very important to Caesar's career and the rest of his life. Which the pirates apparently thought was hilarious. Eventually, the pirates did get their 50 talents, so they let Caesar go. And then about five seconds later, Caesar came back with a bunch of ships and arrested all of them, casually yep. taking his 50 talents back. He brought the pirates to the provincial governor, but since he didn't really seem to care all that much, Caesar took matters into his own hands and took the high road by keeping his promise. And, uh, crucified all of them. Yep. <laughs> Pretty remarkable. Uh, at the same time, this story shows... Caesar's charisma, his ability to get on with people, command their respect. Uh, they thought he was just joking when he said that. It also shows Caesar can be very brutal, and if he promises to do something, he will keep that promise. He will come back and crucify you, uh, even if you thought you know, you're just lightly joking about it. He is a man of his word, and he is willing to do what it takes. Uh, so, I think this story is so popular, whether true or not, I'm not sure, because it highlights these important facets of Caesar's character. Fun! 
Moral of the story <laughs> is Caesar cares a lot about his image. He's amazingly charismatic. He's not afraid to take mm -hmm. matters into his own hands if he needs yep. to, and he does not screw around. On to yep. more historically significant matters, our boy Gaius Julius Caesar was a well-to-do nobleman from a prestigious family that traced its ancestry back to the epic hero Aeneas and his mother Venus. However, Caesar had a chip on his sh Yes, he came from an important family that, I mean, of course, he would only make more important through his actions. ...shoulder because his dad was never consul. You see, in Roman culture, the concept of nobilitas was rooted in the idea that you can inherit excellence, but you have to confirm it by doing excellent things in the present. So, mm -hmm. unlike in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and the early modern period, you couldn't just coast by on familial prestige. You actually had to, you know, do something for it. And yeah, it's a very interesting way of looking at things, and I'm glad they framed it in that manner. Um, it still sounds... It's, of course, a little off-putting to, I think, a lot of us who would rather have pure meritocracy, but it's this idea that you can inherit some form of excellence, but you have to prove it. And to be fair, <laughs> that's a lot better than what we see throughout most of history. They pointed out the, the feudal era... Yeah, honestly, all the way up until the modern era, we can look at nepotism. I think they're right, uh, particularly if we look at, say, feudal Europe. Um, you didn't have to prove that you were worthy of being a landed aristocrat. That was just inherited. And, of course, a lot of stuff was inherited in Roman society, too. Connections, family name. Um, so I don't want to gloss over that, but I think they are right that you had to achieve something impressive yourself for you to be well-known, respected. Um, so, you know, there is an element of meritocracy there. And honestly, that's a good descriptor for the Roman Republic as a whole. There were certainly these inherited aspects, aristocracy, stuff that would be more uh, familiar to the feudal system that would come afterwards. But there was an important element of meritocracy um, that a lot of societies don't have at all. So, it's interesting in ancient Rome. Caesar's dad not being consul was a big deal, so his primary goal in life was to confirm his nobilitas by just being consul. To do it, he struck a deal with two other prominent Romans, Crassus, mm -hmm. the richest man in Rome, and Pompey, Rome's most accomplished general. Yes, the money, the face, the muscle. That's honestly a good way of describing it. We have the first triumvirate. It's a remarkable political alliance, but one that makes sense when you think about it. You have Crassus. He's the money, as they put it there. He can fund anything the two other guys need, but he's not very popular. Uh, he's seemingly not very charismatic. He doesn't have a lot of um, political power or reputation on his own, separate from his money. You've got Pompey. Pompey has a good reputation. He's a very famous general, but he doesn't necessarily have the negotiation and political skills that he needs to get done what he needs to get done. He's very talented on the battlefield. He's a little less talented in the political arena. Then you have Julius Caesar. He's charismatic. He's also a talented general, though that would uh, become more clear over time. Uh, he's the rising star of the group. He can bring in popular support to any scheme the three want to achieve. It's a pretty damn good partnership. And they created an informal alliance. In other words, they made the first triumvirate. They were all good friends, Pompey married Caesar's daughter, Crassus bribed Caesar's way to the consulship in 59 BC, Caesar mm -hmm. passed all the laws that Pompey and Crassus wanted, it was a good time. In the process of ramming through debt forgiveness and land redistribution legislation, Caesar maybe definitely broke several procedural norms and did things that were straight up illegal, but since he was oh, yeah. consul, he had Imperium, the gold Mario star of Roman politics, which meant that he couldn't be prosecuted for his actions while he was in office. Yes, and for Roman politicians, uh, particularly Caesar, to be honest, but any Roman politician who was fearful of prosecution, you wanted to hold Imperium um, for as long as possible. And you could get Imperium from, um, well, they have it on screen right now, the supreme authority of a general in the field. Uh, Imperium took many forms in the Republic, uh, in the government, uh, for civic and military offices. So there were a bunch of different offices um, which you could get Imperium from. So if you were a consul and you thought, as soon as I'm done, the Senate is going to pull me up on corruption charges, I better get a position that also grants me Imperium. And uh, that was particularly a concern for Caesar, who, 
you know, he's an interesting figure. He was a reformer, and frankly, I think many of his reforms were necessary and pretty helpful to the Republic. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people liked them. They were pretty popular amongst the public, but he was not one for procedure. He was breaking the Senate's rules, disregarding, uh, you know, the traditional way of doing things so that the patrician elite were not very fond of him. So Caesar had to worry about being prosecuted in his future. Regularly overriding the veto of your co-consul on the principle of because I said so and filling the city with legionaries to dissuade your political opponents may be definite no-nos in the eyes of the Roman elite, but no one could really do anything about it. Anyway, yeah. for Caesar's year in power, he was safe, but once that consulship and his imperium expired, Caesar had a big target on his back, so he needed mm -hmm. to find a way to keep his imperium until he was allowed to run for consul again ten years later. Well, once again, it's... And, of course, Caesar was an elite patrician, but he oftentimes had the power of the people behind him. So we are seeing sort of hints of that plebeian versus patrician split, though at this point in Roman history, it's a lot less clear-cut than it once was. At one point, it really was the patrician class versus the plebeian class. Both were very firmly defined. They had their own traditions, um, their own rights, etc., etc. At this point, it's a lot more fuzzy, but it is still this idea of, you know, Caesar supporting the wants of the common people, not saying he was uh, doing it selflessly. Of course, he had a lot to gain, but he's supporting reforms that are popular with the people versus the interests of the Roman political elite. Um, so, you know, this trend continues. Uh, like I said, this elite versus common trend continues throughout the history of Rome, and, of course, throughout the history of most, if not all, human societies, frankly. Conveniently, generals also have imperium, so Caesar's next move was to secure himself a governorship of a province and the command of a few legions so he could go around campaigning with all the imperium in the world until he could stand for consul again. Some yep. senators, fearing that Caesar would do literally exactly that, tried to swap his guarantee for governor of a province for essentially governor of the Italian woods. But Pompey and Crassus, <laughs> again, had enough power to overturn that. Coins and stabby things tend Yeah, I mean, we've seen all of this in Historia Civilis' videos. A bunch of conservative senators made a big stink about how the Roman countryside needs to be taken care of, the woodlands need to be examined. That would be a great job for Caesar to have. Uh, and Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus went, N no, he, I'm not doing that. Caesar's not doing that. Give him a real governorship. Give him some provinces. And to get you a lot in life. But here we see just how fragile the Republic really was at this point. Anyone with enough connections and resources could effectively cripple the normal flow of government and steer it in favorable directions for their own benefit. But yep. anyway, Caesar got himself four legions and a cushy governorship in southern Gaul, along with a metric buttload of military imperium to keep him safe, and set about campaigning in Gaul for the next ten years. It's astounding how much we know in detail about these campaigns, and it's because mm -hmm. Caesar himself wrote extensive commentaries on them. This was critical, as he could justify his continued campaign in Gaul year after year by showing how cool he was and how great of a job he was doing, while also building up support among the Roman people by also showing how cool he was and how great of a job he was doing. Like we said, Caesar was brilliant at politics. And one of the reasons is that Caesar knew how to do PR. He knew how to market himself and his achievements. And that's why he wrote down about, uh, wrote down all of his conquests in Gaul. And he sent those back to Rome so everyone could read about how impressive Caesar was and all the territory he was taking and all the, you know, evil Gallic foes he was vanquishing. <laughs> and we still have a lot of those writings today, though, of course, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. We have so much information on Caesar's conquests of Gaul. More information than we have on many different events throughout Roman history, which is fantastic, but they're all written by Caesar. <laughs> so they all come from his perspective and are, of course, extremely biased in his favor. So we do have to take everything he says with a massive grain of salt. You know, he always liked to exaggerate the amount of men his enemy had. He liked to downplay his own defeats and make his victory seem more impressive. But it's good that we have the information at all, even in this deeply biased form. Plus, we got a history out of it, so win, win, yep. win. All right, so in enough detail that I can still sleep at night, but also in short enough form that this video won't be an hour long, Caesar's... Yeah, well, I couldn't make that promise for this video. We're 
already past an hour <laughs> and we've got a bit to go. The campaign went roughly as follows. In 58 BC, Caesar attacked the Helvetii tribe on the pretense that they were attacking an ally of Rome, because remember, Rome would never be so crass as to attack unprovoked. At the end <laughs> I mean, yeah, this was the example I used earlier when we talked about Rome wanting to justify its wars as defensive. Caesar's a good example of how that was basically a formality just to make the Romans feel better. Uh, Caesar's conquests were in no way defensive. He was literally conquering a whole group of people, a whole region, and yet managed to frame each individual conflict as somehow defensive or justifiable. End of each year's campaigning season, Caesar left his armies in Gaul and spent the winters in northern Italy. The next year, Caesar went north, won a battle, and got ambushed one time. In 56, Caesar claimed that the Veneti tribe had, quote, revolted from Rome, even though they were in God's <laughs> Finisterre. So, uh, he conquered it. Safe yep. to say at this point that Caesar functionally considered all of Gaul as already his. Uh, I mean, Rome's. Uh, yeah, and that's what he did. Uh, I mean, Caesar is really one of the most remarkable conquerors Rome ever saw, and that he felt Gaul was basically under his control, and through his actions, that's what he achieved. I mean, he really brought Gaul into the Roman sphere of influence. Uh, in only a couple of years of campaigning, it, it's pretty remarkable. The next year, Caesar went really hard on the Gaul is Roman thing. He considered Britain and Germany as threats to Gaul and therefore as threats to Rome. So yep. in the same year, he bridged the Rhine and attacked some Germans and he sailed across the English Channel. The and I mean, that, his conquest of Gaul was impressive enough. I mean, the Romans, of course, were more involved in Gaul, but he, Caesar, truly established Roman dominion. But even more than that, even more impressive and unprecedented was his... Um, you know, forays into Germany, Germania, and Britain. <laughs> you know, uh, to a lot of Romans, they knew very little about Britain. There was a lot of mystical stuff going around. You know, what is what is up with this island? Who are the people on it? We don't know. Caesar actually landed on it. Now, the expedition was a disaster. Um, as they're saying on screen right now, it was pretty terrible, but it was impressive that he went there in the first place, and of course, great propaganda that he could send back. Uh, and same thing with uh, Germany, or Germania, as the Romans called it. Um, honestly, throughout Roman history, Germania was a scary place with a bunch of scary barbarians, uh, <laughs> and bad things happened to Roman generals if they strayed too far into Germania. But just Caesar being there at all, crossing the Rhine, was impressive in itself. The invasion of Britain was honestly a total bust, so the next year he went back with a huge fleet because the man can't leave well enough alone and pushed as far north as the Thames. After his floundering, humiliating scramble on the British beaches the year before, Caesar had to prove that Rome was no pushover to his enemies, to himself, and to his Romans back home. Oh, uh, also he lost an entire legion to an ambush in the dead of winter. So, uh... Yep. In 53, he went back to Germany and afterwards left half of his bridge still standing in a sort of don't you make me come back there power play. The following mm. year was probably the biggest year of the campaign because the Gedericks had unified the remaining Gallic tribes against Rome. After some battle. Probably one of Caesar's more impressive opponents throughout his life, Vercingetorix, I think, is still remembered pretty fondly. Um, I mean, particularly in France, he's a bit of a, a national hero. Now, of course. Um, you can't really tie Vercingetorix back to any sense of Frenchness. <laughs> it would take a long time before the idea of France or being French would emerge, but, you know, um, he's still a, a bit of a national icon, a national hero in France. I don't know how prominent he is, but I know there are statues of him. He's, he's still remembered very fondly. Battling back and forth, Vercingetorix camped out on the fortified hill city of Alesia. Now, Caesar needed to surround and wall off the city to starve it out, but there was also the distinct likelihood that he himself got attacked while- Yep, another famous battle. We've seen all of these in our Historia Civilis reactions. Um, but I, I do like how we're getting this general history of the Roman Republic. We're stopping at some of the more entertaining and important moments in battles like Cannae and Alesia. Uh, this is pretty prominent and well-known for one particular reason that we're about to see. 
while investing the city. So Caesar needed to fortify both directions. His army built a 10 mile long wall on the inside and a 14 mile long wall yeah. on the outside. That's Two 24 walls. miles of wall that Caesar <laughs> threw down because he was determined to take this city. But oh snap, next thing you know, a ton of angry Gauls come down to attack Caesar. So Caesar rolls a natural 20 on his deception check, <laughs> sends out a cavalry detachment to attack them, but the Gauls think it's the first of an entire Roman reinforcement force. Yep. So they panic and book it right the hell out of there, allowing Caesar to take the city. And just like that, all of Gaul basically belongs to Caesar. Yeah, basically. Uh, and Alicia is famous for the whole two wall situation. But as is displayed there, to be one of these great conquerors throughout history, a Caesar, a Napoleon, an Alexander the Great, uh, of course, you need incredible talent, skill, ability. You know what you also need? You need luck. <laughs> One thing these men all had in spades was luck. Um, you know, I truly, truly believe that. Caesar's a good example of that. Um, there are many instances when Caesar is not performing at his best. Caesar was certainly brilliant, but he wasn't brilliant at every point throughout his life. <laughs> Sometimes he made mistakes, and sometimes he got very lucky. Um, so, you know, you need a little bit of luck to, to rise to that level. Boom, that's how you do a campaign. The next two years were spent cleaning up the last pockets of resistance because, remember, Caesar still had a few years before he's allowed to buy his way to the consulship again. <laughs> to complicate things, Crassus died while on a campaign in Parthia and Pompey feeling- Yeah, very disastrous campaign in Parthia. Uh, it was a big shame to the Romans. Uh, it was pretty embarrassing for one of your most prominent citizens to go on this big campaign against the Parthians uh, and then be killed and defeated. So, you know, like I said, that was a shameful event that the Romans remembered. ...his oats got the Senate to rescind Caesar's governorship of Gaul. So even the triumvirate, which was supposed to be immune to the vices of factionalism, fell victim to the vices of factionalism. Yep. So and I think oftentimes, in a quest to sort of vilify Caesar as the tyrant that ended the Republic, uh, which to be fair, I'm not saying he wasn't that. <laughs> uh, I think Caesar was a complicated and mixed character, but often in a quest to do that, I think Pompey is boosted a little bit. Uh, he's seen as some sort of defender of the Republic against Caesar. Come on, guys. Uh, in my opinion, from what I know about Pompey, Pompey was in it for himself, his own reputation, his own power. He was also a fairly authoritarian character. Um, I don't really think, you know, he's the light in comparison to the dark and evil Caesar. Um, I think that's how Pompey himself might want to frame it. But I think if you look at it that way, that's not really true. Uh, that's not a good sign. So Caesar got Pompey's note, and astutely realizing that going back to Rome on his own was nearly a death sentence, Caesar, feeling his oats, said screw it, or more accurately said alia iacta est, and brought the 13th legion over the Rubicon River and into Italy. Pompey yep. and most of the Senate proceeded to nope right the hell out of town and go to Greece. Caesar, rousing the support of the people, was proclaimed temporary dictator, Latin for a speaker, with the goal of restoring peace. Like, you know, Pompey flees with most of the Senate. He is seen as the defender... Uh, and potential restorer of the Roman Republic. But my point is that, you know, if Pompey had defeated Caesar or if he had prevented Caesar from marching or whatever, if Pompey had been the guy in charge, and we saw that when Pompey was the guy in charge, he was plenty authoritarian too. Uh, he was not the one who would reverse this decline of the Roman Republic. He would uh, probably accelerate it. Maybe not as much as Caesar did. <laughs> I mean, Caesar pounded the Republic into the ground, um, but Pompey would not have restored the sanctity of the Republic uh, any more than most other people would have. Even though he was technically the one who started the Civil War, but shh, details. And he proceeded to absolutely demolish Pompey's army in Greece at the Battle of Pharsalus against all odds. And then yep. he chased poor old Pompey to the end of the earth, which in this case was Egypt. Pompey sought refuge with the boy King Ptolemy who owed him a favor and was likely very displeased to find himself beheaded instead. Terrible way to start a vacation. Anyway, Caesar was absolutely horrified to see Pompey's head because, first of all, he was a fellow Roman citizen, but also Caesar was planning on pardoning him afterwards, not killing him. See, this is a lesson in how healthy communication saves lives. Yeah, and yes, yeah, Caesar was very upset <laughs> to get Pompey's severed head. 
Um, now look, Caesar was very brutal in his conquest of Gaul, but during his fight against Pompey, his civil war, Caesar made sure to be merciful to Romans um, and Roman citizens, but Roman subjects in general. He didn't want to alienate people, right? Caesar wanted to rule over the Republic. Calling it a Republic is kind of formality at this point, but that's what he wanted to do, and so he wanted to get people on his side. And so he wanted to show his mercy and, you know, allowing Pompey to live and pardoning him would have been a great show of mercy. And that would have really sent a message. So Caesar was very upset when he found out Pompey had been assassinated. But yeah, Caesar was super big on clemency. That was pretty much his thing, except for, you know, the pirates he crucified. But anyway, in yeah, except for the pirates he crucified and all the villages burnt in Gaul, which they're mentioning at the bottom, the Gauls he killed and enslaved. He was certainly not about clemency at those times, but when fighting against fellow Romans, it is true Caesar was all about clemency and mercy. In addition to pardoning some people, tribes, and even whole towns during the Gallic campaign, Caesar pardoned pretty much Pompey's entire army and all of his supporters who fled to Greece with him. For me personally, that's one of the most important aspects of Caesar's character. And he was certainly a controversial character, but it's important that hmm. we weigh the good with the bad. I agree. I absolutely agree. I'm glad we're getting a pro-con list. Like I've said many times before, like, you know, we've done a lot of content on Caesar. Caesar was a complicated and mixed character. Uh, and since he has been so well remembered in history, I mean, he is one of the main characters, uh, particularly in Western history. Caesar has been used for a symbol of many things. He's been uh, remembered as a great conqueror, as a tyrant, as a political reformer. Uh, you know, Caesar has been slotted into many different slots to mean many different things. And so I absolutely think it's worth looking at the man and his actions uh, and, you know, considering them fairly and looking at the pros and the cons because he was complicated. You know, he's not a monolith. He didn't represent just one thing. He represented many different things as everybody does. He broke a ton of laws and sold his soul just to become consul, but he made moderate reforms that benefited the people. He killed a lot of Gauls and Romans in the civil wars following his consulship, but he granted clemency wherever he could. And mm -hmm. he basically fashioned himself a king after he was appointed dictator for life, but he yep. was beloved by his people and he used his power to stabilize Rome. All in all, he did do a lot of serious and lasting good for Rome's people, but that good was done through politically devious means for suspiciously power-hungry motivations. Yeah, I think that's a good way of framing it. Caesar did a lot of good for the Roman people, but he was always trying to grab more power for himself. You know, Caesar's intentions were almost never, I guess, what you would call pure. But let's be honest, if you're looking at most politicians or leaders throughout history, most of them don't have pure intentions. So I don't think Caesar is unique in that respect. Um, so Caesar is a very complicated character. You absolutely can frame him as a tyrant. Um, and that's how he's framed by many people throughout history. Particularly in the latter years of the Enlightenment, Caesar was often stand-in for a tyrant who, you know, had brought down a republic. Uh, and people very much didn't like that. But at times he's often been framed as a populist, a reformer who helped the people. This is also true in many ways. Uh, and by a lot of military leaders throughout history, Caesar is seen as a great general, a great conqueror, someone to follow in the footsteps of. He's many different things. He's a controversial character for really good reason. And I'm yeah. doing my best to give you both sides of this right now so you can get a feel for some of the questions people like Brutus asked themselves when they were making plans to assassinate him. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Ahead of myself. Yeah. Oof awkward. While Caesar was in Egypt deciding what to do with poor old Pompey's head, he was making moves both with and on the Queen Cleopatra, <laughs> supporting her in her civil war against her brother. The arrangement proved beneficial for both of them. Yeah, though Caesar's time in Egypt was pretty disastrous. He honestly almost lost his life uh, when he was himself besieged within Alexandria. Um, we saw that in that Historia Civilis video. Uh, this was an instance where Caesar really escaped by the skin of his teeth, uh, and honestly, luck played a big role in Caesar's ability to escape Egypt with his life and, you know, his reputation intact mostly. 
as Cleopatra could count on Caesar's Rome supporting rather than annexing Egypt, and Caesar could count on Cleopatra's Egypt as a continuous source of food, which helped supply Caesar's generous public food programs. And for bonus points, by all accounts, Cleopatra was just plain interesting to talk to. So, win-win. Following Caesar's return to- Yep, and Cleopatra will remain an important character in this series. We're also seeing a grain deal with Egypt. Um, at this point, and up until this point, well, since the Romans had held Sicily, Sicily was known as the breadbasket of the Roman Republic. It provided a lot of the grain that fed Rome. Uh, and we'll see this with- uh, Octavian and the peninsula being blockaded, not being able to get grain from Sicily. But in the future, in the era of the Roman Republic, Egypt will become the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. It will produce massive amounts of grain that will feed the rest of the empire, and it will keep that reputation for a long time. To Rome, his position as dictator was extended to 10 years. During his time as dictator, Caesar managed to instate even more reforms that promoted public welfare, government efficiency, and general stability. For yep. one, he limited the political and military power of provincial governors, mostly to stop other people from doing to him what he did <laughs> to Pompey in the Senate. He also reformed the monstrosity that was the old Roman calendar. Yep, he reformed the Roman calendar, and he gave us what is basically the calendar we use today. Now, there have been notable reforms along the way. Um, uh, in particular, uh, at one point, there was a big shift, but the calendar that Caesar created is, in many ways, the one that we still use. So well that we still use a version of it today. He also yep. conducted a census, carried out several building projects, unified the Roman provinces more closely with Italy, and was just all around a really solid leader. Did he pull a lot of super mega illegal stunts to get himself to this point? <laughs> Absolutely. But did he make substantially beneficial reforms that the people loved? Absolutely. Well, we saw, you know, when Caesar was assassinated, there was a lot of um, anger about his authoritarian actions, Caesar basically making himself a king. But when he was assassinated, the people were not happy because Caesar's reforms had been popular. His authoritarian actions hadn't been popular. Um, I mean, particularly not with the Roman elites, but not even with the people. But the reforms that he passed were incredibly popular with the people. And so the people were upset when he was killed. You know, this is sort of the complexity of Caesar. We saw that Caesar went on a big tirade against corruption. You know, he limited corruption within the Roman Empire. Even though, of course, he was extremely corrupt in his own way. I mean, he had never followed the rules. He did everything the way he wanted to do it. But he still passed those reforms. So, a complicated guy. <sighs> okay, this is the part that makes me sad and angry. In March of 44 BC, Caesar was named dictator for life, and this made a lot of senators really antsy, because at this point he was basically king, and Rome still very specifically didn't like kings. On the yes. Ides of March... And not just the Roman senators, the people didn't like kings. They talk about this event where Mark Antony offers Caesar a crown, and Caesar refuses it. Um, there's some speculation over, did Caesar always intend to refuse it, or was he waiting for the reaction of the crowd? We don't know. But when Mark Antony offered Caesar the crown, the reaction of the crowd was bad. <laughs> they did not want Caesar to be a king. They were not happy. So, a complex figure, once again. Arch Brutus, Cassius, and about 60 other senators surrounded and killed Caesar in the theater of Pompey. Ironic. Caesar's last moments are rather disputed, but my take on it is that when he saw Brutus, his friend, whom he had pardoned after Pharsalus was a part of the conspiracy, he accepted his fate and fell to the ground, covering his face with his toga. Mm. I don't think Caesar even was eloquent enough to have fancy last words when there were 23 knives simultaneously stabbing him. No one is. The assassins may have fancy- Though, as we saw, there were something like 60 around that number of conspirators, maybe more, I can't remember. Uh, most of them just stood around doing nothing, <laughs> while a small few actually did the stabbing. Um, and a lot of those who did the stabbing stabbed Caesar after he was already dead, or on his way to death's door. There were, I think, like four or five who actually landed decisive stab wounds while Caesar was alive and fighting. So most of these conspirators didn't actually do much. They themselves liberators and restorers of the Republic, but they didn't count on the fact that the Romans really liked Caesar because, oh gee, I don't know, he was a generous and effective leader. 
While I yep. may disapprove of Caesar's actions in his early career, I abhor his assassins. He granted them clemency and they killed him. I'm not going to make a moral judgment on Caesar's assassins. That's not what I'm here to do. What I will say, I'll make a logistical judgment on them, <laughs> which is that, you know, they decided to assassinate Caesar because, amongst other things, they wanted to restore the Republic. But they had no plan for what to do after they assassinated Caesar. They d decided not to assassinate any of his subordinates, like Mark Antony or Lepidus. And so when Caesar was gone... Uh, those two in particular, Mark Antony and Lepidus, took up Caesar's mantle and continued doing what he was already doing. The conspirators made the choice not to deal with that. They made the choice not to do a takeover of the government to institute a new Republican era. They just didn't really think about what they were doing. I mean, they did. They, they had lots of debates, but I, I think they were incredibly naive. They thought just by assassinating Caesar, you know, everyone would come together and we would return to the golden days of the Republic. They needed to do a lot more than that if they wanted to bring back the Republic. Uh, and that was clear because everything went absolutely terribly after they assassinated Caesar. Um, a bunch of authoritarians stepped up to seize power and the Roman Empire descended into even more political violence and instability. Dante puts Brutus and Cassius in the lowermost pit of hell for betraying their protector, and I'm with Dante on this one. Anyway, that's Caesar. I, I mean, I will say, uh, I said I'm not making a moral judgment, but like on a personal level, if you take all the politics out of it, it was pretty brutal that men like Brutus and Cassius took Caesar's life when they were so close to him. <laughs> I mean, Brutus in particular had a familial relationship to Caesar. Caesar, in some ways, was a bit of a father figure to him. And so, that's pretty brutal, man. <laughs> you know, that's certainly not a good thing to do, to assassinate someone who you have that personal relationship with, regardless of the surrounding politics. Stabbed 23 times and left bleeding out on the floor of the Curia. Brutus and Cassius were able to read the mood in the room well enough to tell that they weren't wanted, so they and a bunch of senators hightailed it to Greece to build up an army. But it doesn't yeah. end too well for the assassins, but I'm already into overtime, so let's wrap this up. In my mind, Caesar killed the Republic long before he was even dictator. He proved how breakable the system was. Let's count it. He bribed his way into office, illegally rammed legislation through the Senate, intimidated his political enemies with threats of force, escaped any and all consequences for his actions on a technicality, commandeered Roman resources for his own prestige and enrichment, marched an entire legion into Rome, and declared war on a fellow Roman for his own political gain. Yeah, so, you know, the Roman Republic was already in deep decline before Caesar, and a lot of the things Caesar did had been done before, but Caesar did them more blatantly, more obviously, and more often <laughs> than many other people. I mean, Caesar just blatantly uh, abused the system and did whatever he wanted, with no regard for procedure or, honestly, most of the time for the will of the Roman Senate. Um, and so I, I agree with what they're laying out here. The entirety of Caesar's main political career was either distinctly unrepublican in character or explicitly illegal. And remember that only after all of that did the Senate name Caesar as dictator for the first time. By the time Caesar was named dictator for life and functionally had become a king, he had long since proved that the Republic was fundamentally broken. For yeah. most of the Republic's history, its success came from fantastic Roman teamwork. But here, its downfall came primarily from the selfishness of powerful Romans. People realized how incredibly fragile and gameable the institutions of the Republic were when you stretched them across the entire Mediterranean, so basically one of two things could have happened to Rome. Either civil wars continued on and eventually ripped Rome to bits, or something in Rome's government changed to make it less susceptible to all those civil wars in the first place. Basically, it was monarchy or bust at this point, because nothing else could stop the chaos. Well yeah, I mean, if we think about Roman history from this point onwards, the periods of stability will come under men like Caesar and Augustus. Of course, Augustus, who would be the first Roman emperor. So you can kind of prevent a present a convincing argument that the only way to stop this chaos was with some sort of monarchy or system of emperors. And that is basically what happened. After Caesar, uh, you know, he, those who came after him, his subordinates, Mark Antony, Octavian, they followed in his footsteps, did what he did, and then, of course, Octavian, who became Augustus, would just take it further. 
but Augustus would provide stability that Rome had not seen, well, since a brief period of time under Caesar, but honestly, if you look at this whole time period, a sense of stability that Rome had not seen for a long, long time. While Augustus becoming emperor down the line was far from a guarantee, Rome's transition from a republic to a monarchy was inevitable if it was to survive. It's a little par- Yeah, I, I, I don't want to use the word inevitable, because I'm not sure if some things are, but most things are not actually inevitable. But close to inevitable, maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I do agree that the decline of the Roman state, the decline of the Roman Republic in particular, was terminal. Something had to change, and it really didn't look like it was going in the direction of more republicanism. <laughs> uh, most likely, it was always going to go in the other direction, more authoritarianism. Paradoxical, but in a way, Caesar saved Rome by destroying the then unstable and unworkable Republic. He abused the hell out of its institutions, but in doing so, he showed how effective a strong and stable central government could be. And this was the basis of Rome's accomplishments for the centuries to follow. Today, Caesar kills the Republic. Next time, Augustus starts an empire. Thank you so much for watching. All right. Um... Okay, I very much enjoyed that one. So we did the Roman Republic um, today, right now. <laughs> We've already done the Roman Empire. And so I guess the next one on our plate is the Age of Augustus. Um, so that'll be interesting to see because we did kind of cover that in their video on the Roman uh, Empire summarized. But I'm curious to see some more detail on Augustus because I think he's super underrated. He's far more important than people give him credit for. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, I don't have too much to say. Uh, I feel like I said everything I wanted to during the reaction. I mean, this one is about an hour and a half long, so I certainly have talked for long enough. Um, like I said, I enjoy the perspective with which they approach Roman history. I don't agree with them on everything. I think particularly in this one, there were some places where, uh, you know, we sort of differed in how we viewed things. Um, but that's completely fine, right? Uh, that's, that's okay. You can view history with a different lens than other people. And I do appreciate the way they present Roman history uh, and the way they frame it. I, I really like that. Uh, I really enjoyed it in their video on the Roman Empire, and I enjoyed it in this one, too. So, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment. Check out the Patreon and channel memberships for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.